In this session, we will explore the other three models within our matrix, which shape and define the nature of Jewish peoplehood and the relationship between Israel and world Jewry. These models are shared believers, partners, and investors. What does each require? What does each assume? Are they helpful foundations for our Jewish collective life? Are they still relevant today? Or more importantly, what do we need to do to revitalize them as constructive forces? I will then explore these issues in greater depth in an interview with my colleagues, political and social activists, Tehila Friedman and Rabbi Seth Kirshner. As stated, today we will explore the categories of shared believers, partners, and investors. Let's begin with restating our definitions. Fellow believers are a group of people who join together by virtue of a shared belief or commitment to embody or promulgate a value, principle, or cause. To be part of the Jewish people is to be part of a group with a common mission. For example, the commandment to be holy, tikkun olam, the commandment to be a light unto the nations, to being God's witness, to not give Hitler a posthumous victory. One joins because of one's identification with the mission. One connects it if one so chooses. But the primary motivation for such an exit may be when one believes that the mission is no longer shared or no longer relevant or compelling. Partners are groups of individuals who join in a common undertaking with a shared purpose. It can be to further a certain belief, but it can also be for less idealistic reasons, such as one's safety or self-interest. What is important about this specific category in the context of the relationship between Israel and world Jewry is that partners share both the risks and the profits. While exit is possible, one cannot exit at will. If there are losses or liabilities, one remains responsible. To a partner is to be a partner together in good times and bad. One exits the partnership principally when the aim of the partnership is no longer shared or when it has been achieved or when one of the partners is perceived to be acting in bad faith. Investors do not share in the mutual obligations of partners. They invest with the aim of gaining or facilitating a particular end or outcome. What is particular about this category and the reason it is important in the context of Israel and world Jewry is that it involves the expenditure of money, capital, or resources. And such expenditures are always complicated. An essential aspect of the investor relationship is that it embodies a core asymmetry between the one with the capital and the investee and the inherited power and need imbalance which it implies. The investor exits with relative ease once the outcome has been achieved, when there are unacceptable losses, or when the investor believes that achieving the particular outcome is no longer feasible or shared by the investee. Our first category looks at the Jewish people as a community of fellow believers. While Jews were first and foremost family, we were also a community built around shared belief. In the word of the Ten Commandments, I, the Lord, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt, the house of bondage, you shall have no other gods besides me. We went down to Egypt as a family and were redeemed because we were a family. Once redeemed, however, Judaism opened up a new chapter, what I referred to the in the beginning of this series as the covenant of becoming. As introduced first in the book of Exodus, now then, if you will obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Over the millennia, the shared beliefs of Jewish life varied and changed. Belief in some notion of God, loyalty to the Jewish people, commitment to the essential practices of the law were more or less constant and generally accepted as our foundational shared beliefs. With emancipation and enlightenment, however, Judaism, more than uniting us, began to divide us. Shared beliefs became the foundation of denominations and sub-communities, which competed for the loyalty and identity of Jews and often undermined a singular Jewish collective identity. 
After the Holocaust and with the establishment of the State of Israel, however, the majority of Jews worldwide found a new set of beliefs around which the Jewish people could unite. It was a shared belief around the significance of Israel. This shared belief served as the cornerstone of the relationship between Israel and world Jewry. It involved two core principles. The first was that the safety of Jews required the existence of an independent, sovereign homeland for the Jewish people, a place of refuge for Jews if and when their lives were threatened, a place with a Jewish army prepared and capable of defending the Jewish people. Through Israel's existence, never again was not an aspiration, but a policy. The second shared belief was that the homeland of the Jewish people would give expression to the best of what Judaism and the Jewish people stood for, a state where Jews were responsible for shaping all aspects of life in the public sphere, which would serve as the stage in which Jewish values and principles would be amplified and become a light unto the world. These two beliefs, as you saw in the source book, paralleled the two essential features of Zionism, if you will, a Zionism of being and a Zionism of becoming. What is interesting and particularly challenging is that by the end of the 20th century and now the beginning of the 21st century, both of these beliefs no longer serve to coalesce the Jewish community in North America around support for or even a relationship with Israel. For North American Jews, despite the recent increases in anti-Semitism, America and Canada are not merely perceived as homes, but by and large welcoming and safe homes. Without belittling the concern about the rise, rise of anti-Semitism, most North Americans still worry more when their children visit Israel than when they walk the streets of Toronto, New York, or Chicago. With the exception of European Jewry, it is in Israel that the highest number of Jews experience the most risk, be it from terror, Hamas or Hezbollah missiles, or potentially nuclear Iran. The idea of Israel and Jewish sovereignty as necessary for Jewish safety, so central to Zionism and the relationship to Israel pre and post Holocaust has slowly eroded as Jews experience continued at-homeness in North America. Paradoxically, one of the most powerful expressions of this can be found in what is commonly perceived as the most pro-Israel North American institution, APAC. APAC does not serve merely as a pro-Israel lobby, but represents an alternate theory for how best to ensure Jewish survival in the 21st century. True, Israel and the IDF are crucial, but for the pro-Israel community, a no less significant source of power is located in Washington thereby elevating North American Jewish life and its influence on Capitol Hill to the status of being equally important for Jewish physical safety. APAC, Jewish federations, the Joint, the American Jewish community, the Israeli American Council are all expressions not merely of Jewish homeness, but of Jewish power and influence, which life outside of Israel uniquely provides. However, it is around the second aspect of the shared belief in Israel's significance the, that we are witnessing the greatest transformation. The growing debate, discomfort, criticism, and alienation regarding Israel's policies on occupation, state and religion, religious pluralism, democracy, and minority rights have eroded for many the idea that Israel represents the best of Judaism and Jewish values, and the exemplar of our responsibilities to be a light unto the nations. For many North American Jews, their Jewish lives represent the best of Judaism and are more a light than Jewish life in Israel. This is all the more true in the current American partisan discourse, where Israelis and North American Jews are often aligned on opposite sides of the partisan political divide, and where one sees the other as profoundly morally flawed. Belief in Israel has suffered the same fate as Judaism did in the past. Not only is it not shared, but it is now often itself that which divides us. There is, however, an even more substantive challenge which needs to be overcome. 
The shared beliefs which united Israel and world Jewry involved a consensus around the significance of Israel alone and did not evolve into a shared belief in our mutual significance for each other. North American Jews are called to embrace the significance of Israel in their lives, despite the fact that Israeli Jews have never really developed a narrative of the contribution of North American Jewish life in building a viable and significant Jewish life in the modern era. Israel and Zionism want to serve as the uniting force in Jewish life, despite often rejecting the validity and importance of the North American Jewish experience. This sentiment fueled much of Israeli government decisions to not go through with the proposed upgrade in the space at the Kotel for liberal Jews. For Israelis, this type of liberal Jewish worship is still principally viewed as a North American Jewish phenomenon. Israelis see the world as being divided between the places of Jewish destruction and the place of Jewish rebirth. Destruction, whether through Holocaust or assimilation, are the destiny of all diaspora Jewish life, while rebirth is the exclusive gift of Israel. For Israelis, all diaspora Jewry is essentially in the same condition. What changes is the current stage of anti-Semitic manifestation. Proud North American Jews who are at home and who see themselves as modeling the best of what Judaism stands for, notwithstanding the assimilationist pull, which is, which is the consequence of being at home, have great difficulty joining with Israel around a shared belief system which only values Israel and is not reciprocal. North American Jewry challenges Israel to create distinctions within the diaspora and to investigate whether within the Zionist narrative, which sees Israel as the rebirth, there is room also for rebirth in some communities outside Israel. The future of the model of shared belief between Israel and world Jewry depends on whether Israelis and North American Jews can develop such a narrative together. Let's turn now to the model of partnership. Here too, and I know this is beginning to sound like a broken record, we are, in face, we are facing increased challenges. But if we do not put the difficulties on the table, we cannot repair them. The most Zionist of North American Jews, those for whom a relationship with Israel is essential, a given, and a core component of their Jewish life and identity, often view the partnership model as a central framework and guide for their relationship. When confronted with the unraveling of their shared beliefs and with an Israel that they experience as at times paternalistic and disrespectful, they stand tall and declare that to be a partner is a commitment to be responsible both in good times and in bad times, a commitment to share in both the benefits and losses. As partners, they declare a commitment to an Israel as they believe it should be and do not allow their perception of Israel as it is to undermine in any way their loyalty. In fact, it is precisely in pointing out Israel's shortcomings that they give expression to their deepest love and commitment and, if you will, fiduciary duty as partners. In doing so, they perceive themselves as following the Jewish tradition, which understood criticism as an act of love rather than disloyalty. As partners, their greatest adversary is not Israel or the policies they reject, but rather the North American Jew who allows him or herself to become apathetic and simply walk away. As partners, they seek to model how family, shared belief, and consumerism can unite into a new force. As family, they reject any possibility of exit. As consumers, they demand an Israel which sees them and which will be relevant and inspiring for their Jewish lives. As consumers, they demand that together, Israel and world Jewry will develop and live by a system of shared beliefs which will make this possible. It is, however, as partners that these various models coalesce into a force working to build such an Israel. It is precisely in this manifestation, however, that the partner model alienates Israelis. While for North American Zionists, the partnership model is a vehicle for the relationship for which they yearn, Israelis often experience this manifestation as alternately frightening or paternalistic. 
frightening in the sense that Israelis are reticent to allow anyone, no matter how well-meaning, loving, and committed, to have a vote, influence, or shape issues of life and death for Israelis. While security policies and Israel's positions vis-a-vis -vis Gaza, Judea, and Samaria, and the occupation have profound moral underpinnings and implications, the consequence of foreign policy moves have a direct impact on the security and well-being of Israelis themselves. There is a broad sentiment that those who live six to 10,000 miles away do not have the same grasp on reality as those at ground zero. For most Israelis, the idea that someone who does not live here and who is not personally, intimately knowledgeable about the reality of the Middle East, that such a person will have a say is frightening, disturbing, and even morally problematic. They experience the desire to help Israelis and save them from themselves to be deeply paternalistic and undermining to the democratic process within Israel. When one adds to the equation the current partisan political divide and the fact that many of Israel's Jewish critics seemed to be politically aligned with the left in Israel, whose electoral footprint is shared by only about 10% of Israeli Jews, such partnership intervention is perceived as even more unwelcome. Come live here, Israelis say. Be full partners. Put your children in the army and live amid the complexity of the Middle East and only then give us advice. The paradox of this reality is that it's precisely those North American Jews who care the most about Israel and Zionism are those from whom Israelis often feel most alienated. However, the partnership model faces an even deeper challenge. It is not merely the fact that Israelis do not welcome a partnership on issues pertaining to security, but the fact that Israelis have never really seen diaspora Jews as partners. Even though the partnership model allows for asymmetry with senior and junior partners, Partnership nevertheless assumes some level of parity. For Israelis for whom Israel is rebirth and redemption, diasporic Jews who represent the old Judaism, which is destined to disappear, do not warrant the status of partner. The current relationship is simply too one-sided to allow for a functioning sense of partnership. Resurrecting it will require a reaffirmation on both sides of the significance and contribution of the role of the other, as well as an honest exploration of the rules of our partnership. What are those areas that Israel and its internal democratic process should determine alone? And which areas can be shared by Jewish partners around the world? Are there limits to legitimate criticism? What are the areas where partnership entails telling the other what one thinks and how one feels, as distinct from those areas where partners can tell the other what to do? Such a conversation has yet to emerge, for most Israelis are willing only to accept diaspora Jews as investors in the enterprise of Israel, an enterprise where Israelis are the sole players and diaspora Jews the providers of some of the capital, be it monetary or political. Let's explore the investor dynamic a little more deeply. For many North American Jews, this model of investor is deeply compelling and attractive. In some cases, it is even preferred to that of partnership, precisely because of an awareness of the distance and the fact that North American um, children's lives are not on the line. In this sense, investor, with its more modest role, feels more appropriate. For others, however, it is attractive precisely because of the power dynamic that it allows, with wealth, and influence buying one a significant seat at the Israel table. Now, an interesting development in this investor model is that with the increase in the financial prosperity of Israelis and Israel, the need for North American Jews as investors is diminishing. In fact, as stated in the basic law, Israel of, as the nation state of the Jewish people, Israel now sees itself as an investor in the future of Jewish life in the diaspora thereby fulfilling yet another aspect of the Zionist dream. There is a constant challenge inherent within the investor relationship, resulting from the deep power asymmetry that it entails. 
there is often confusion as to who is more significant, the one who invests the capital or the one who uses it to build the enterprise, a fact that hinders the fostering of a real, not to speak of a healthy relationship built exclusively on this model. Recently, the investor model has come up against an even more significant development. The role of North American Jews as investors in the relationship is contingent on their ability to deliver significant capital. As stated, a powerful and successful Israel is in less of a need for the infusion of capital in a financial sense, but it is actually in the realm of, the cap of capital in its political sense that the investor model is now being reshaped. What are the implications for the investor model when Israel has now identified better investors with greater political capital and who are less critical of Israel's policies? For many Israelis, Christian evangelicals are better investors than the majority of liberal North American Jews. The partner investor models have evolved into a comedy of errors, where one side views themselves as partner while the other at best sees them in, as investors, and increasingly not even at that. When coming to the table, it is no longer clear what the ground rules are or who is still invited. Family, shared believers, partners, investors, consumers. Since the rebirth of Israel, each has played a critical role in the relationship between Israel and world Jewry. In many cases, those models were profoundly positive and helped to maintain a relationship despite our geographic and ideological differences. At times, however, they created an appearance of a close relationship, while merely plastering over schisms and disagreements that were festering and becoming ever more significant. We are facing a new era where Israel and world Jewry can no longer assume the inevitability of a future together. If we want such a future, we need to take responsibility for it. First, we need to understand that at times, we come to the relationship with different categories and expectations. As in all relationships, health and strength are not achieved through overcoming and eliminating all differences, but principally through recognizing it and understanding them. When we appreciate where the other is coming from, we can reduce the consequences of conflict and at times even facilitate new forms of cooperation. More significantly, it is necessary to recognize that certain categories, while essential in the past, are no longer sufficient or even beneficial in the present. As Jews, we have walked through the valley of the shadow of death together. Today, it is our responsibility together to develop new syntheses between our categories and possibly new categories to sustain and revitalize our collective identity. We are a family, but we need to build new possibilities of shared beliefs. While we disagree on a policy level, can we build a language of shared values to which all can ascribe? We need to see each other as both consumers and partners in this effort, as we seek out common principles and ideas for a country which aspires to be Jewish and democratic serve as the homeland for the Jewish people and not merely Israelis, serve as a model and a light for Jewishness to the world, all the while struggling to survive in one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the world. In the current environment of partisan divides, this will be difficult, but it is necessary. The challenge of Jewish life in the 21st century is how to survive being in two homes together. Thank you. In the lecture, we explored the models of shared believer, partner, investor, the interplay between them, the way they're changing today, the roles they played in the past as distinct from the roles they play now and possibly in the future. Today, we're gonna to delve more deeply into each one of these categories. And joining me are Rabbi David Seth Kirshner and Tehila Friedman. Welcome. Thank you, good to be here. David, so much of your rabbinate is about ensuring 
that Jews maintain a relationship with Israel. We know each other for a long time. It's, it's, it's in every part of your being. Um, which model of these three speaks to you the most? I hope it's not investing. <laughs> well, as investor in so far that we're all invested in Israel. And I think there is a symbiotic relationship there. I think we are equal parts of all three, actually. We are shared believers. We are shared consumers. And we are shared investors. There's a sense of pride when we feel that sense of investment. I think some of the challenge lies in the fact that, frankly, Danielle, we've become a people that has two identities, a diaspora identity and an Israel identity. And two people in the diaspora, you mean? No. Or the overall people? The overall Jewish people. People, yeah. So two people with different core identities, some shared common denominator, some shared DNA in there, but some of it's quite different. And I think that's a hard thing to reconcile. But if you look at it historically, we've always been two people, whether it's Sephardic or Ashkenazic, whether it's um, that we're from Eastern Europe or Western Europe or North Africa, these kinds of things have always been divides in us that we have celebrated and not used as a differentiator. But for some reason or another, we're really worried, like it's an existential threat for these differentiators. I think it's something we should think about embracing more as opposed to making as a conflict. But is there a reason that some of, some of these, some of the things that are, some of the differentiators now aren't just there, they seem to be pulling us apart today in different ways. Like, for example, in shared belief, when I just don't believe that Israel is that good anymore. And so it's not something that I'm different. Now, you could be in Israel, by the way, you could be in North America, but I don't, I don't believe that some of the causes of Israel are, that Israel represents the best of what the Jewish people are about. So is, is celebrating enough? How do we overcome some of those moments? So that's a notion I don't subscribe to. I see. So it's hard for me to understand. I Very believe interesting. In, I believe everything that Israel does is for the betterment even with some mistakes. Now, I mean, Tell me more about that, because it's a really important voice. So I don't mean everything that the Israeli government does is for the betterment. I don't mean the, everything the Israeli Rabbanut does is for the betterment. I think the notion of Israel and what it stands for is for the greater benefit of the Jewish people as a whole. And not all of that is individually met. That sometimes other people having their needs met is beneficial to us, even if it doesn't scratch our itch. And that's a value for us. I think that's ultimately what a sense of pluralism is about, too. So, so for you, your pluralism enables you to embrace Israel as, the, as a shared belief, embodying the best of what the Jewish people are. In an ideal world, absolutely. And in the real world? The real world, it's harder to reconcile at times because there are parts of that world where you aspire for a sense of understanding, and people who don't subscribe to it don't give you that understanding. And inherent in the definition of pluralism, you have to embrace them. But if they're not speaking that language, you don't know how to include them. So that's really challenging, right? So if you take people who you know, are pluralistic in their understanding of what it should be to have multiple minyanim and options that are available, whether it's at the Kotel or whether it's at the Tachana Rishona, whether it's at the first station that's become this like eclectic space in Jerusalem, there's a whole gaggle of people that says it's fantastic, another gaggle of people that says this threatens my existence. So the pluralistic side of me says, I understand both views. Where the rubber hits the road is when the person who says it threatens my existence tries to stop it. Stop you. That's hard. And then it's hard for you to embrace that shared belief. That's correct. Tehillah, as an Israeli, what's the Israel that you believe in? And do you think that the divide is an Israeli-North American divide, or, or is it a different divide? <laughs> ישראל היא, היא נס, אבל חוץ מזה היא כלי. זאת אומרת, המדינה היא לא הפרויקט. המדינה היא כלי לפרויקט היהודי. הפרויקט היהודי הגדול הוא או אה, להיות ברכה, כמו שאברהם אבינו מצווה והיה ברכה, או אה, להיות אה, ממלכת כהנים וגוי קדוש. הציונות שלי יושבת על זה שאני... מתרגשת מזה שפעם ראשונה אחרי אלפיים שנה יש לנו הזדמנות להיות ממלכת כהנים, שיש לנו הזדמנות להיות ממלכה. 
ושיש לנו ריבונות, ושיש לנו יכולת to practice our Judaism, public sphere, כאילו לקבל החלטות פוליטיות, התורה בשבילי היא טקסט פוליטי, היא מנסה לבנות חברה, ולא רק אינדיבידואלים. אבל במובן הזה, ישראל, המדינה היא כלי. ולכן מאוד קל לי גם לראות יהודים אחרים, אפילו שהם לא פה, כ-shared believers, כי בטח יהודים אמריקאים, הרבה מהם אני רואה אצלם מאוד חזק את העניין של להיות ברכה. כאילו, אז זה יכול להיות ברמת האינדיבידואל, זה יכול להיות ברמת הקהילה. אבל זה תמיד נורא מרשים אותי. זאת אומרת, אנשים שחיים מאוד חזק, גם אני רואה את זה בפילנתרופיה, אבל גם בכאילו ב- מעורבות, כל ה-social justice movement, זה תמיד יהיה יהודים. אני קוראת את ההיסטוריה האמריקאית, אני... פמיניסטיות, שהן לא פמיניסטיות דווקא, לא שהן פמיניזם של בית כנסת, פמיניזם בכלל, והן יהודיות, וזה לא סתם, משהו ברסטלס הזה, ובדבר הזה... את מאוד מכבדת. לא... כשאת מדברת על, 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 על יהדות צפון אמריקה, אני מרגיש שאת מכבדת אותה. אה, זה יותר ממכבדת. אני מרגישה ש... קודם כל, יש בי צד שהוא פשוט עם הכרת תודה. אני פמיניסטית. עכשיו, אני פמיניסטית דתית. לפני שהייתי פמיניסטית, הייתי פמיניסטית דתייה. זאת אומרת, המקום הראשון בעולם שבו עלה בדעתי שיש בעיה היה בית כנסת. ואני יודעת שבסוף אנחנו הבאנו את זה. את ה... זאת אומרת, הרבה מהפמיניזם הדתי נניח התפתח בארצות הברית. ו... אז יש בי הכרה טובה על הדבר הזה, לא רק, בכלל, כל ה... כל הניסיון הזה למצוא את הדרך לחיים יהודיים, יהדות וערכים ליברליים, איך עושים, הומניזם, וערכים הומניסטיים, איך עושים את הדבר הזה, שזה אתגר ישראלי ענק, אני מרגישה שיש... So you've moved me to, a, to a, it's, it's interesting, when you speak about shared belief, then, and I was speaking Hebrew before, that's, כן. we're in uh, our two homes, I'm just forgetting which home I'm in. Um, the, uh, um, it's interesting, you moved shared belief to another place, which is, um, I, wa- I want to, delve deeper into it because part in the lecture I spoke about how it's and, and you were uncomfortable with it a certain that it's a shared belief about Israel as the unifier of Jewish people and you felt that that was moving that was putting Israel in a place that is Israel's a, a means not an end when in many ways Israel served as a a means to unify Jewish life you're trying to move us to a higher in a certain sense more of Jewish men, dimension of shared belief. Tell me a little bit more about if, what would be the shared beliefs that you would want to have with, with world Jewry? When I go back to the beginning of the Zionist movement, I see that they were already there. It was clear that outside of the Jewish people, to the Jewish people, there is also a desire to create a country that is... or a country אור לגויים, שהיא חברת מופת, כל... זה, זה חלק נורא חזק בשפה הציונית מההתחלה. ישראל היא פרויקט. היא, היא, היא right. פרויקט, היא עדיין כאילו בשלבים לא כל כך... לא ממש בהתחלה, אבל די בה... היא פרויקט צעיר. We're not there yet. No, we're not there yet, and, and I'm not sure we'll ever be there. But I, I think... What Tehillah is saying, I, I agree with. I, I actually had, you know, underlined in the walls of this building, which is Judaism is not supposed to be in a Petri dish, and neither is Zionism. And it is an ongoing, refined act. And this idea of we have a state, we have a government, we have a people, therefore it must be perfect, is naive. It's utopian, which inherently is partly naive, right? I subscribe to that fully, that, you know, just like in any relationship we're in, whether it's with our spouses, with our children, with our bosses, there are perfections and imperfections and appreciate and accepting what that's like, even with our relationship with God, from being a religious view, is about accepting those imperfections and saying, this is the whole picture, and it doesn't live in a Petri dish. If we only study the Talmud and we never take its application to the real world, we've done no service to the value of the Talmud. And I, I, I appreciate very much what you said on that front. Do you want to conti- go, go back to the shared beliefs a little bit? Now, how do you respond to, to David? Here it is, someone from outside of Israel looking at Israel. I have to say that I am very happy when you say that. Because many times I feel that the Jews are looking at Israel as an example. And also, I don't know, 
כאילו, בא לי לומר להם, למה, ארצות הברית יותר טובה היום? זאת אומרת... But that's not a defense, but you want to say it. I know you feel... לא, כאילו, אני מבינה, אבל כאילו זה לומר, מה זאת אומרת? כן, למדינה ולחברה יש ups and downs ויש תקופות, ו... We are struggling, כאילו, אני... ומשהו במבט הזה שהוא אומר, אוקיי, זה לא מושלם, אנחנו... דווקא אני, בתור מי שיש לי... You're much more critical of Israel. כן, by far, by far. Because I know your whole career... is about fighting for, for, to build the Israel that you will feel Jewishly in the broadest sense of what you define as Jewish in the moral and, totally. and that, that this is the Israel you want and you're going to fight it and, and, and here you use it. So it, how does it feel to you? No, so I'm saying, so it's clear, it's clear that I'm more... And just because of that, there's something that's very interesting to say, I understand that there's a fight. ואני גם מוכן להיות פרטנר בפייט הזה. See, that moves us to the partner model. And uh, I want to ask both of you about that. Um, I want to say one thing. Breshit Rabat t- teaches us, love without admonishment is not love. And I think what makes it work for Tehillah is that no one, not you, not me, no one can question her love for this country when she offers admonishment. But today... You would be surprised. There, Well, uh, I... <laughs> they shouldn't. They shouldn't. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> But today, for some reason or another, there's a problem that some people are offering admonishment in either in their tone, their direction, or their platform. We are becoming leery of their motives, and if indeed that is coming from a place of love. When you criticize Israel, Until you get there, there's so many other things. There's, <laughs> I love Israel, and I didn't, when you were talking before, and I didn't know if you were talking about Israel as it is, to even accept that there's a difference between theory and reality. I wasn't even sure. You're, you're, not, you're not on a comfort zone. Criticizing Israel is not a comfort zone for you. It's, um, it's, it's there. You know, this is, we're not talking about the family model, but this is, it's your family, and that's where you start. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to criticize, but you're just, From the beginning, like, you know, when Jerry McGuire, you had me at hello. Yes. Like, Israel has you at hello. Um, but let's delve into the place of criticism. Now, I accept, and, I, and you're right, part of the challenge is, is that criticism today is, is, is seen as an act of disengagement rather than the way our tradition sees it as, as, as a sign of love. How should criticism take place? You spoke about... The language you spoke about the forums you spoke about how should criticism take place is the first part and the second part I want to ask you about is what what are the how do you criticize um, how do you criticize where where are the limits too constrictive and where do they have to be extended in your in your mind so I'll start with a, a teaching from David Wolpe who pulls in one of his favorite theologians uh, the Simpsons and Marge is hosting Thanksgiving and And her mother and sisters walk in the door, and she opens the door for Thanksgiving, and she said, "Marge, I just want you to know you've done nothing right." <laughs> and uh, Wolpe uses that in a, a brilliant way of saying, like, "That's our relationship with Israel, because only Marge's mother can pull that off. If you come into my synagogue and you hear me criticize Israel, anyone who's been to my synagogue for more than 10 minutes knows that it's being offered in a place of love. Now, if you've not been there for more than 10 minutes and you're just getting a snapshot, Of one moment you can misinterpret that and in the binary world in which we are morphing into that's a dangerous place so so it's not that you, so in your synagogue you criticize Israel I'll criticize Israel when I think it deserves to be criticized just like I will criticize my wife and my children when I think they need to be criticized but you won't criticize them in shul <laughs> <laughs> you no. better not I better not and my love for them is unconditional they're people who I'd lay down in traffic for and I would do the exact same thing for the state of Israel but offering that criticism doesn't mean that that I am playing with the tether of our relationship. And for some people, to, to offer that criticism feels like you're, you're taking a knife to the rope that connects us, and it shouldn't. Is it the motivation, or is it the consequence of the criticism It's that frightens you? It's not only the motivation uh, and, and the tune. It's also you speak in we. I can hear criticism when people speak in we. Yes. I can't take it when it's you versus us. That's a tool... It's, it's just something so, different. I, let's, let's expand on that a little bit, and I think that's really important. This North American Jews as partners, 
are North American Jews who say, Israel's the homeland of the Jewish people. I'm here. I'm in it. I'm, 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 count me in. I'm here. I'm going to be here, but I'm not going to be here just to wave a flag. Partners don't wave flags. I'm here to roll up my sleeves. I know it's not the same, but I'm here to... I want the Israel that I could respect. I want an Israel that my children could have a relationship with. What do you feel? Are, the, are there limits to criticism? Be, and how do you feel about criticism made by partners um, who don't live in Israel? As an Israeli, how do you feel about it? And are there limits to where you're saying, just excuse me, just stay away? <laughs> Um, זה אפילו לא ביקורת, זה, זה כאילו דיון um, בכל מה שקשור ליהדות. עכשיו, איפה עובר הגבול בין דברים שקשורים ליהדות לבין דברים שקשורים לסקיורדי או דברים כאלה? זה קשה, אני מבינה שזה לא... זה לא אפשר להתווכח על זה. יהדות למה את מתכוונת? דת ומדינה, כן? מעמד האישה? כשאתה אומר משהו על הכותל, זה אובייס... כאילו, זה שייך לא בדיוק כמו שזה... זה בדיוק, אני, הכותל הוא שלך, כמו שהכותל הוא שלי. אני מרגישה שאני אפילו יותר מזה. ברגע שאני אומרת, הכותל לא שלך, אני חותרת תחת הזכות שלי אה, לכותל, בגלל שבסוף מדינת ישראל היא מדינת העם היהודי. זו הסיבה שקיבלנו אותה מ... כאילו, קיבלנו את הזכות לדבר הזה. מבחינה ציונית, אם אני לא... אם אני לא... כאילו, אם אני מרחיקה את העם היהודי וזה מפסיק להיות מדינת העם היהודי, למה יש לנו זכות למדינה? אין עם ישראלי. אז במובן הזה, כאילו כשמדובר על ירושלים, על, 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 על הכותל, על גיור, יש כל מיני נושאים שהאימפקט הוא מאוד מאוד ישיר, וזה ברור. כאילו זה כמו... So איך אתה אומר? זה no taxation without representation, it's not taxation, אבל זה כאילו... הם, דברים שהאימפקט הוא מאוד ישיר. That, so for you on all issues of state, religion, etc., which impact on world jury, Israel belongs to them to the... The exactly. Judaism of Israel belongs to them just as much as it belongs to you. Right. Where Aval? What's the Aval? The big Aval? Now, things that are related to security, to questions of war and peace, things like this, that the impact is so dramatic on our lives, on our children, that all the kids are real, but it's the real life, it's our lives. There, there's a lot more difficult. יותר well, קשה או, ב... או, או אסור? שם אני חושבת שזה counterproductive. זאת אומרת, היכולת שלנו לשמוע היא, היא, היא הרבה יותר נמוכה. עכשיו, יש דברים שהם in between. כאילו, נגיד, כל הסיפור של refugees. כאילו, כל הסיפור הזה של, של immigrants. עכשיו, זה, זה יהודי, זה יהדות, או שזה... זה, 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 יותר, זה, יותר, זה יותר מסובך yeah. הדבר yeah, הזה. רציתי להגיד שקודם כל זה מסובך. What isn't complicated that's meaningful in our lives, right? right? Yeah. Like, relationships are complicated, so many jobs are complicated, life is complicated, but the things that matter the most, my relationship with God is complicated, the things that matter the most to me that are complicated, I embrace, I don't run away from. And that's the beauty in it. See, so but that's, that's what a partner, one. a f family and partner says, complicated is not my problem. Um, it's like encumbered. It's like encumbered. Right. One of the, the, the challenge, though, Here I want, to, I want to push both of you yeah. out of your comfort zone a little bit, because this is a love fest. It really is. Yeah. And, and, and I feel really good at it. And, I, and I, I respect it, because I know it's, I can't take it for granted. And I don't want, though, to vilify a whole bunch of people who aren't in this love fest, for whom pain about occupation pain about things that Israel is doing um, are just too great. And they don't know how to stay inside. They don't know how to feel that love. And you, and you say to them, do it out of love, and I'm with you. But they're not with you. They don't, they don't feel, they're saying, this is, it's, it's, you, there is no yes but. It's, it's, it's about the occupation. You know, it's, what am I supposed to do? Israel is not what I want it to be. The gap between it, and they have a list. You know, they check the list. It goes. It goes from, from, uh, from, from democracy and religious freedom and refugees and Palestinians and morale and, and God. It just goes down. At what point? Now, for you, it's not there. You'll never get to that point, as you said. You'll, it's, but how do you deal with those Jews? They're your, if they're your congregants, they're your congregants' children, 
you have you look at the American Jewish community, Canadian Jew at large. You're not just in in Temple Emmanuel. You you have a bigger space. How do you deal with that? Because just you can't to silence it. In we have to put it at, on the table here. אבל זה אותו דבר כמו שהם מרגישים כלפי המדינה שלהם. למה זה אחרת? So כאילו, כשהם מסתכלים על... על, על It's על... a fair enough question. It's so a very good question. question. I, I think one of the, the categorical differences is, is that for whatever reason or another, when it comes to our Jewish identity, of which Israel plays a significant role, the idea of erasing a part of our DNA feels sacrilegious. Whereas in America, we feel that we have come, we have arrived, we have planted, we have flourished like nowhere else before, but we're still nomadic. In so far that if God forbid what has happened in Spain or in Eastern Europe were to happen in America, we could take the same values and move them to Argentina or move them to Madagascar. That is an unbelievable statement. That's just, so, that's just an unbelievable statement. I want to offer an opposite answer, but I want, but I'm very happy that your that statement was on the record because it's an unbelievable statement. Of, um, I thought it was actually the opposite, which is, and that is that since I'm American and I've or Canadian, I have nowhere else to go. My criticism always stays inside, and so it, since it is my home, Israel's six to ten thousand miles away. And you need greater energy, but it so reflects your commitment, your who you are and family. That, and I'm not, and and I'm not arguing with you. I'm saying there's there's two sides of the story. One side is, and it's remarkable. This is that Israel is sacrilegious when it violates its principles in a way that America or Canada are not, because I don't have my whole Jewish identity invested in it. I love it. I never thought. I thank you. You just gave you gave to the I Engage series a gift. The other side is, this, is that at what point, from six, it's just, I, I need so much effort. Here it is, America's America. So you know what, I don't like this president, or I'm in Canada and I don't like this prime minister. It'll pass, but I, I'm, this is my home, there's nothing I could do. But why have a relationship with Israel if it crosses over so many things? And so here you increasingly, see, you were hearing that. How do we allow them See, they don't know how to be partners. They've given up. And how do we? What place do they have in that conversation? So that's the problem. So, so let's dial out, right? Let's come up to thirty thousand feet for a minute. At thirty thousand feet, I think we have to admit that Jews as a whole, diaspora in Israel, we are kvetchy, wangani lot. <laughs> Spoken are, as a rabbi. Spoken as a rabbi. <laughs> we won't show this, the, by the, the way, Pope, in your. In, 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 they in, show it. Uh, they know. <laughs> The Pope goes to <laughs> goes to Yad Vashem, and he didn't lay enough wreaths. Right? Like this is the number he didn't he didn't the wreath acknowledge. Wasn't big enough. He didn't acknowledge of what this happened. It's the Pope goes to Yad Vashem. Let's think about the history of the papacy and the Vatican. And he goes to Yad Vashem, and one of his first acts was the Pope Benedict. And all we saw were <laughs> condemnations throughout the entire Jewish media world. So as a whole, you got to say like, okay, we are predisposed and wired to be a kvetchy lot. If you dial out of some of that kvetchiness, and we can start to say, okay, let's engage. Let's, let's, let's care about it. I actually think that Americans today are becoming more engaged in the civic process than ever before. And I think the divide that has happened for someone like me, who is a rooted, passionate Zionist, but a proud American, who has in conflict now my love for the state of Israel with my Jewish values as an American, that this has led people like me, which I think there are plenty of in America, to be engaged in the America they dream about. I think this has happened time and time again in the 1800s for sure, but definitely during the 60s. For, you have to fight for the America you want right now. The America you dream about. The dream about. And when it's not what we want, we don't give up. We roll up our sleeves. And what I've seen from people who are philanthropists, what I've seen from young dreamers, what I've seen from older people is they're rolling up their sleeves and being engaged in the process. And I think it's very similar. I agree that it's similar. So, two things I agree. One, why Israel is afraid of you more, I understand that. I got to the point of the decision that I can do with people who don't have the power, but people who have the power of the power, אני לא יכולה לעשות את זה. זאת אומרת, אנשים yeah. שבשם אלוהים עושים דברים רעים... זה, זה, 
זה גדול עליי. Yeah. אז, אני, אז אני מבינה את המקום שאומר, אוקיי, מדינות, אבל זה יהודי, אני מבינה את זה. Yeah. זה, זה הרי בא מהמקום הכי עמוק היהודי שלנו, שאני לגמרי שם. אני גם חושבת, אבל, שבאמת קורים תהליכים דומים בשני המדינות, ולכן אני לא בטוחה שהחלוקה הזו של החברה הישראלית, the diaspora jury, it doesn't work like that. No. בגלל ש... קודם כל, החברה הישראלית מורכבת הרי מחלקים שונים, וגם היהדות האמריקאית יש בתוכה חלקים שונים. והחלק... ובתוך כל אחת מהחברות יש כזה cultural war inside, מ... בין... קוראים לזה קונסרבטיבים לעומת ליברלים, אני לא יודעת אם זה מה ש... אני לא בטוחה שזו ההגדרה שאני קונה אותה, אני לא yeah. יודעת, אבל סביב ערכים של שוויון. סביב ערכים, ש... סביב ערכים הומניסטיים, סביב הבלנס בין הקולקטיב לבין האינדיבידואל, בין ה... יש, יש בשתי החברות, זה, זה תהליך בינלאומי, הסיפור הזה של אנטי גלובליזציה ועלייה של לאומיות וכל מיני דברים כאלה, והם קורים בשני המקומות. Yeah. אז אני מרגישה ש... ש... לכן זה כל כך מוזר לי, כשאני שומעת אנשים אומרים, או oh, ישראל היא ככה וככה, ולכן אני לא במשחק, אני לא משחק יותר, ואני אומרת, אבל בבית זה אותו דבר. Listen, there was a law in Arizona a few years ago that allowed the police, without any background, to stop and frisk anyone that they thought was an illegal alien or doing something wrong, without probable cause. This was against the Constitution. This upset many liberal Americans. I didn't hear one liberal America say that they should boycott, divest, or sanction the state of Arizona. I didn't hear one liberal American say, I'm never going to Arizona, I'm never flying over Arizona. I didn't hear one liberal American say, I'm not supporting any of their sports teams. I didn't hear any of that sort. Meaning, the brokenness in America is something that we accept as democracy is a continuing experiment. The brokenness in Israel we take as a shattered piece of glass that can never be put together, and that's the wrong paradigm. David and Tehillah, it's a great place to end. Thank you so much for being with us. It's my honor. It's an honor to talk with you. Thank you.